Hello, bonjour and ahoy. I'm Roger Hilton, Defense and Security Research Fellow at Globsec, coming to you from Vienna, Austria. Ukraine, Europe's longest serving conflict right now between Ukraine and Russia sadly shows no signs of dissipating and could be entering a dangerous new phase. What started in 2014 as the illegal annexation of Crimea has transformed into an on again, off again hot conflict that has survived three American presidential administrations, two European, presid two European Commission presidents, three Ukrainian presidents, and of course, one Russian president. But now with Russian forces amassed at Ukraine border, all bets are off and anything is possible. With me today is somebody who is no stranger to this conflict and has intimate insight into Russian statecraft. It is my supreme pleasure to introduce Mr. Alexander Daniluk, former Minister of Ukraine and former Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council. Mr. Daniluk, it's a pleasure to see you. Yes, hello. Hello, Richard. Hello. In addition to his former responsibilities, Mr. Daniluk is now the uh, co-founder of the Center for National Resilience and Development in Ukraine. So, Mr. Daniel, like, let's get into this right away, like Russian tanks on a train moving south. What do you think are the driving factor, factors motivating the Kremlin to set an increase in military posture against Ukraine? Well, it's a combination of factors. Clearly, it's a way for Putin to, um, to respond to Putin killer. Okay. Um, which everybody was... Um, happy it is in Ukraine that finally U.S. president, a uh, new U.S. president basically uh, says the right things, you know, say, says the truth very clearly, brands somebody who is a killer, a killer. On the other hand, it's absolutely clear that um, that uh, would trigger also reaction uh, of Putin. And given that he cannot do much to the United States directly, you know, um, he can do something to Ukraine, uh, a strategic partner of the United States in the region. So that that could be one reason is to demonstrating the the force is basically a way to kind of communicating with this threat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, it also um, fits uh, very well uh, other uh, context, and um, that is the political situation within Russia. Absolutely, and. Um, you know, clearly the factor that uh, in autumn there will be new elections coming, that was a factor in Russia, always. And uh, Putin never misses opportunity to to basically to demonstrate his uh, leadership, um, strong leadership qualities, uh, just to, to reinforce his position during these, these elections. Um, so this is a combination of, of, of both. Uh, also, I believe the third factor is that Putin um, also understand that uh, at the moment the leadership in Ukraine is, um, you know, relatively weak, mm -hmm. and so he's also trying to take advantage of that. So basically, this is like three, uh, three, three factors put, you know, put together uh, triggers his behavior. All right, so Mr. Daniel, you've outlined the three areas or factors why Putin might be doing this. We have the domestic reasons for it, the discontent me the handling of the pandemic and obviously a lot of the discontent surrounding the Alexei Navalny, potential signaling with the uh, current Ukrainian government and as well testing of the new Biden administration. But amidst all of this, what do you think is the end state of President Putin right now? And what do you think the likely outcome is? Obviously, if they wanted to roll into Donbass, there would be no problem as they have escalation domination. But what do you actually think he wants to get out of this military signaling? Well, when we say ultimate goal is uh, ultimate goal is uh, remains the same. He wants to get control of Ukraine, uh, bring it to its sphere of influence. Uh, it's always with the ultimate goal of Putin. Mm -hmm. Specifically for this endeavor that uh, we um, and the rest of the world actually observing, um, it's uh, um, my my hypothesis first is that such a collection. Uh, will end with something. Mm -hmm. Putin, it's a, it's a big investment, not in terms of money, money is also significant, right? But it's also a huge uh, political um, uh, investment. Uh, so he arises states and he cannot just withdraw without any trophy. Ah. So clearly he will claim something. 
Uh, and my fear, it will be something actually uh, claimed on Ukrainian territory. <laughs> what it could be? Um, it could be, you know, uh, a large scale uh, military aggression, which I believe we cannot rule out. But logically, this is not what Putin wants to, um, I would think, to get, because the, it will not be a quick uh, victory. Mm -hmm. It won't be victory, right? It definitely, you know, uh, to start with. Um, so this is not what his, uh, that would be quite a dangerous uh, scenario for him. But again, he could behave irrationally mm -hmm. at the moment. We always like assume that he behaves rash rationally, but you know he could be irrational. Um, other options uh, could be actually working with my colleagues on uh, on, uh, on the center, you know, within the center of national resilience and development with Pavlo Klinkin and Ruslan Bashavka. Pavlo Klinkin was a foreign minister for mm -hmm. five years in 2014, and also worked a lot on um, you know on. Um, Funding of building the uh, diplomatic um, coalition against Russia uh, on Normandy format, also working in Normandy format. Mm -hmm. So we have a team who is quite, you know, quite experienced, and we're looking at currently several scenarios what actually could happen. Uh, one of the ways, and actually Russia is moving this direction, is um, you know integrate uh, Donbas and Lugansk uh, regions, which are currently uh, not under control of Ukrainian government integrated to Russia, you know, that will be a kind of trophy. Um, obviously, there's a big uh, problem for Russia, which is um, impossible to resolve, simply impossible to resolve, is getting water to Crimea. Yes. And uh, so basically, Putin has several um, in, um, cards on the table. What he's going to play, we don't know, but for each scenario, we need to get ready. Mm -hmm. uh, he could play actually several at the same time. For example, you know, integrating uh, Donbass to Lugansk and at the same time uh, trying to secure the uh, uh, water uh, supply to, to Crimea. So uh, while the uh, first will, you know, the Donetsk Lugansk, uh, Lugansk integration would, uh, would not involve military um, uh, uh, conflict, right? Direct conflict, but clearly uh, getting through Crimea to Ukrainian, uh, well, to Ukraine is Crimea. Uh, sorry, yes, Crimea is Ukraine, right? But you know, getting the from uh, from Crimea Russian troops uh, to to Kherson Oblast to get a uh, supply of water that clearly will cause a, a large scale war. And um, but again, this is a scenario um, which 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 is possible. But at the moment, he just raises the stakes. And he will try to find a, a large trophy enough to, to withdraw. I mean, thank you for your foresight on the issue. And the one issue for me that always stands out is obviously the worst thing for President Putin is body bags coming back of dead Russian uh, uh, soldiers. Obviously, the Memorial NGO has done a lot of work on that, about the cover up uh, and trying to minimize the deaths. And that really leads into my next question, Mr. Danny Luck. Obviously, a huge amount has transformed uh, since 2014 in terms of the Ukraine military and the reforms that have taken place. They've received substantial aid. There's a lot of training going on, especially with Operation Unifier uh, in Lviv. So can you speak to sort of how different the Ukrainian army is right now compared to 2014 and assess their ability to defend themselves versus Russian aggression? When we uh, assess uh, possible consequences for Putin, um, possible consequences for like large scale war in 2014. We estimate this, um, that to get, uh, for Putin to get control of the land bank, the Ukraine, of, uh, of, from the Ukraine River, river right? um, it will be at least 70,000 troops, you know, casualties, calamity. So, for, at that time, for him, it was a too high price to pay. Yes. That's one of the reasons he didn't actually sure. And at that time, our army was in a totally different uh, state than its uh, currently. It doesn't mean that the Russian army didn't, uh, you know, enforce um, uh, its capacity, you know, its, its potential. Clearly, it did. Uh, Putin invested a lot of money in operating the, uh, the, the arms. 
Um, and so clearly, the Russian army is uh, more technically advanced at this stage, more technically advanced in the uh, But um, but our, our army is now fully uh, supplied with arms. <laughs> it's better trained. It's actually you know it's trained actually on the field. You know, yes. on the field. So I think it just erases the, the price that uh, Kremlin, if he decides to go uh, this route. Uh, to pay, obviously, it will be a higher price for Ukraine. But we're now talking about uh, the casualties way past 100,000. This is Putin cannot afford at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, clearly, uh, Ukraine uh, uses this time um, to, to reinforce the army. And uh, that is like one of the biggest impediments of Putin. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, increasing the lethality of the Ukrainian soldiers raises the cost for Putin, not to mention, obviously, the arms package that the Pentagon agreed to a couple of weeks ago to uh, enable the Ukrainian forces to better defend themselves. Another area that significantly changed, uh, Mr. Danny Luck, is obviously the introduction of COVID-19 to the battle space. Uh, how do you think that influences the organization of forces uh, and even doctrine or strategy on both sides of the border? Well, it's actually interesting. Yeah, no. I see uh, how Russia plays this uh, situation, but it's more like trying to. Russia was trying to play this factor. I'm mean, specifically uh, mentioning vaccine, you know, uh, yes. right? as, as, as a weapon, as like a new weapon, right? Yes. Yes. And um, it actually, it was quite uh, threatening. You know, three, four months ago, because all the Russian propaganda was actually trying to destabilize the situation in Ukraine, saying, "Look, there is a savior coming from Russia, and you know, for some reason, Ukraine throws it together." Yes. That was the way to destabilize the country from <laughs> there. But obviously, when uh, uh, President and our National Security Council introduced sanctions against pro-Russian media, you know, that was basically. Uh, yeah, 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 sort of propaganda in Ukraine, first propaganda. You know, that fact that it's not uh, at play anymore. Uh, so I think this is actually quite recent because Putin is not a new situation. You know, for Putin, obviously, it's much better is to win over Ukraine without military intervention. That's why he was trying to destabilize the situation using his agents here. You know, um, <clears throat> the parties, propaganda, media channels. So, but um, over the last uh, months, there is an active, um, uh, you know, act counter action on the Ukrainian side, um, reducing the influence of these uh, engines in Ukraine, which actually leaves Putin with another way, which is military intervention. There is. But you know, as I said, you know, it's still situation. You cannot afford, you know, to not to touch them because they're actually eating country from within. Yeah. But when you do this, they they also to Putin, and that's the reason actually why he is now exploring um, this military role. Uh, that's a very interesting assessment uh, about sort of how they're trying to weaken the resiliency and now have had to resort to to hard power to do it. My last question for you, Mr. Danielik, is obviously Ukraine has a has a desire to join your Atlantic structures, EU and NATO. Apart from, you know, direct member states sending military aid, how would you so the EU and NATO to actually help Ukraine right now defend itself? Is it sanctions? Is it uh, another Normandy format? But any any insight on how you think both NATO and NATO could help Ukraine would be greatly uh, appreciated. Well, there's a lot of talk about the new Normandy format, you know, US joining, you know, we can talk a lot about this, but um, I'm quite skeptical about this. Mm -hmm. We understand that uh, in all these forums, um, there's always the Russia on the table, right? And, um, you know, like Russia is very good in playing diplomatic games. Um, it managed already to play diplomatic for uh, for almost six years, and pretty much um, you know with no particular resolution, right, uh, for Ukraine, you know, giving Ukraine interest. 
So giving a new format, I think it would just will be, you know, potentially a new diplomatic victory, <laughs> but no real impact on what's happening. Yeah, no tangible gains. Um, in terms of, uh, of NATO, as you've seen, maybe it's uh, our leader, uh, our president, um, now openly says about, uh, uh, you know, actually, demands uh, of accepting Ukrainian data. Obviously, we all supported on that all Ukrainians, a majority, I'd say. Mm -hmm. A majority uh, of Ukrainians now support joining NATO. Uh, the one issue is that Ukrainians don't understand. Um, they see NATO as spurious in the middle of their lives. But what is also important is, uh, and this is actually our role now of uh, Civil society well, is actually to raise awareness. It's not about only military. Eventually, it's a new quality of, of life, it's a new way of you know, building a democratic institution. It's something we should really less. And this is what uh, Zelensky is actually doing. Basically, only uses like, you know, get at me. What we need to do is to, uh, in this uh, brief period of time, uh, to prioritize the reform that actually helps us. To act, and, you know, um, so, and that will be a win-win, really. Uh, that will be a win-win uh, for me and, and for us, for our society. Um, so, at the moment, obviously, uh, you know, that's, that's one strategy. Second is getting the, the status of uh, manager of the um, uh, United States outside of NATO. This is something which we also support, and we believe it's quite a practical way to proceed. Yeah. Well, Mr. Daniel, we've already taken up so much of your time. Thank you for your wisdom and your insight on the issue. And I'm sure, unfortunately, we'll be in touch again, seeing how the situation is uh, is unfolding. So again, thank you very much uh, and have a great time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.